calculation. Again, a lot of the labs, especially in teaching programs, they report the anion gap and they red flag it. Some hospitals, some community hospitals, they don't report it. They just give you whatever is there and you will be like, oh, whatever, this person is just fine. But this person can very well have like sepsis or could very well have DKA unless you look for, you know, unless you do your, DK, your mud piles little cheat sheet. I would make sure a lactate, and I'll start giving her tons of fluids, and I would make sure she's not in DKA, measure her glucose, and and clinically, I mean, she probably does have a lot of sepsis because maybe her creatinine is not normal for her. You know, creatinine of 1.2. If you if you have a baseline, you would understand the patient is probably an acute kidney injury. So I would just give her a lot of fluid, and then and, and look for sources of sepsis. So we we do a chest X-ray, we do a UA and a urine culture and you get a good history to try to see what's going on but internal medicine internal medicine patients are very um, it's tricky because in PETS I think p people believe that pediatrics is, is harder because you're you're dealing with with a kid that cannot give you history but the kids more or less they declare themselves like they look very different adults can actually can be very seriously ill and you can let them home go home like I've had patients discharge home with ongoing heart ischemia or like an undiagnosed PE. So like the pathology of the adult population is more complex. You know, I think the internal medicine job is more, it has a more liability for sure. It has more liability, especially when you're admitting, if you realize when you're admitting a patient, let's say that you're a hospitalist, pediatric hospitalist, you're admitting a patient probably with one problem. When you're an internal medicine hospitalist, you're admitting patients with multiple problems and not necessarily medical but could be like psychiatric or social and that that also accounts for a lot of the you know bad outcomes so I probably would do it again if I had to be a career choice I'd probably stay as an internal medicine doctor because I love patient physician interaction but I just want you guys to be informed about your decisions when you're mm -hmm. when you're ready to make decisions yeah because these patients are complex internal medicine patients are complex how in this case would you have done to do no, I would have I would have not done the pH in the first place, but I would have calculated the, the gap. Let's say like I just ordered the Chem Seven, I look at the gap, it's yeah. like oh shoot, this lady has a huge gap, and at that point I would have done a blood gas. Basically, always calculate the gap. Yeah, least. always calculate the gap. The teaching point is always calculate the gap. That's the teaching point for that case. Okay, cool. Thank you. Very good. Why don't you go next with the uh, 26 year old thin female uh, complains of weakness. In Lab sodium 136, potassium 2.9, fluoride 87, bicarb 36, bun 18, creatinine 0.9, pH of 7.50, PCO2 of 46, urine sodium 30, fluoride 6, pH 7.6. That's a urine chloride, by the way. Okay. Two pH. Okay. So, first thing we do is look at bicarb 36 and it's high. So, it's either going to be metabolic alkalosis or respiratory acidosis. Then we take the pH 7.50, which is high. So mm -hmm. it's metabolic alkalosis. Very good. Mm -hmm. So then um, now we're going to do your old cheat sheet way. And remember the chloride, remember I give you the chloride, the urine chloride, because it's either chloride sensitive or chloride resistant. So this is chloride sensitive? Mm -hmm. Chloride sensitive because it's less than 25, remember? Okay. Okay. All right, so you're going to do the next thing, you're going to check is for compensation, for right? Compensation, so for you, you're saying 10 out of 7. So like our bicarb right now is 36, and then you're saying PCO2 is 7, I'm trying to remember 46, so the bicarb would be 12, oh, because you're going 36 minus 24 is 12, okay, mm -hmm. that makes sense. So if the ratio is 7 out of 10, because that's our cheat sheet, mm -hmm. so we want 70%, 8.4 over 12 would be about 70%. So now we look at our PCO2, PCO2 which is um, 46, and we want it to actually be... 30, so that's 16, so we're double. Almost. No, no, no. no PCO2 is 40. PCO2 is 40. Okay. PCO2 is 40, so you expect so an six. increase in a metabolic Minus alkalosis, two. you expect an increase of 8.4 points. And we're getting an increase of 6 plus or minus 2 of 8, like 16. Yeah, eight. you can probably say it's probably fine. So you we're know. okay. Yeah, I mean 2, 2.5, that's, that's probably okay. Okay. Then we do anion gap, so that's mm -hmm. 136 minus 87 and minus the chloride, which is 6. So we're at, what is that, the 93? 13, right? 13, okay, so. So no gap, right? No gap, because 10 to 12 means no gap. And uh -huh. then you're done? No. Okay. Mm -hmm.
Well, what did she have? Weakness and fatigue anemia. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. You're gonna get that question on your boards. What does she have? Does she bleed? Yeah, anorexia. Anorexia nervosa, yeah. Look at the potassium depletion and the metabolic alkalosis. Chloride sensitive, remember? Metabolic alkalosis because she's puking up all her. Yeah. Hydrogen from the stomach, from the gastric. Yeah. You see, you look at the lady and then. I'm weak and the BMI is usually less than, the, on your boards they're going to give you a BMI of less than 20. They may show you a picture of the gums, um, you know, they, yeah, they give you like all sorts of hints. But if you look at the labs, you can say, okay, this, probably, this lady probably is bulimic, anorexia. All right, why don't you go ahead with this one. You have a 65-year-old male with a history of smoking two times per day for 30 years, I admitted her increase in trans Sodium is 137, potassium is 3.2, chloride is 92, bicarb is 35, his pH is 7.36, and his PCO2 is 59. So first look at his bicarb is high, and then we look at his pH, his pH is low. So, well, if we just go off of bicarb, the bicarb is high, so that would mean metabolic alkalosis or respiratory acidosis, but because of pH is low, we're thinking of respiratory acidosis. Okay. So then our second step is to check, um, well, we took the pH, so then our third step is to check compensation. So we mm -hmm. use Winter's formula or we use the No, sheet. because it's a, uh, well, no, no use the cheat sheet. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we use our little cheat sheet, and uh, we see that our bicarb is up by about 10, and we're dealing with respiratory acid doses, so you go at bicarb or PCO2 first? You go at PCO2, PCO2. because you're dealing That's with right. respiratory acidosis, remember? So the PCO2, it's 59, right? Right. So the normal is 40, so it's almost 20 points, right? Correct. So you expect to see a change in the bicarbonate from 2 to 6? And we're seeing how much? We're seeing a change of about 10, 11. So this person also has a metabolic alkalosis, right? Yes. Okay. So we have a respiratory acidosis and metabolic alkalosis and mm -hmm. the HFPA Ten. So you're done. Right. right. <laughs> so, so what does he have? So he's got chronic COPD. Yeah, he has a bad COPD and he has a classic finding when you have a chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure, you mm -hmm. always develop post hypercapnic metabolic alkalosis. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the kidneys are trying in attempt to you know, reduce the amount of like, like the, the, your chronically respiratory acidosis, your pH is low, so your kidneys try to hold on to bicarbonate yes. in the proximal tubule. So you're always going to see, always going to see um, post hypercapnic metabolic alkalosis in such a patient like this when it's chronic. Okay? Yeah, so this is classic. Uh, you know, sometimes they call me like, oh my god, this patient's bicarbonate is 40 something. He needs new lungs, there's really nothing I can do. That's, that's pretty much what it comes down to. Yeah. And if you try to bring it down, it's dangerous because that can cause like, like, like problems, you know, CNS problems when you try to bring down the, the bicarbonate acutely. Some, some nephrologists, cowboy nephrologists, they use hydrochloric acid, all sorts of stuff to bring down the bicarbonate level. It's just, he needs new lungs, that's the bottom line. Okay, your turn. This is a different form. Oh, this is, yeah, we're done. Yeah, that's okay. yeah. Right. An elderly lady with COPD and CHF presents with anasarca, ABG, that's me, ABG prior to therapy uh, shows a pH of 7.29, a PACO2 of 60, a PAO2 of 70 on 2 liters of O2, and after losing 5 kilograms during treatment with Lasix drip, 
repeat ADG shows a pH of 7.34, a PaCO2 of 85, a PaO2 of 60, and uh, potassium 3.1 milliequivalents per liter and depleted. Uh, which one of the following would be the best treatment for her worsening hypercapnia? So number one would be IV normal saline. Number two would be IV 100 millimoles hydrochloric acid through the central vein. Sounds awful. Um, That's what some nephrologists do. Number three would be oral ammonium chloride. Number four would be hemodialysis. And number five would be acetazolamide. It's a hard question. So essentially what they're telling you is that a woman with bad CHF and bad CHF and COPD, she came in massively overloaded and then we started diuresing her and remember when you give Lasix, one of the side effects from Lasix is more metabolic alkalosis. That's, that's basically one of the side effects. So if you have a lot of metabolic alkalosis, that's actually dangerous because that decreases the respiratory center, like the, the drive for like spontaneous breathing goes down. and that's the reason why you have to pay attention to this because if you don't pay attention the patients are going to stop breathing they're going to get confused they're going to exhibit more and more hypercapnia and that's what actually this lady is having her pco2 was, was 60 and then like a few hours later on the lasik strip the pco2 is up to 85 so i'm pretty sure this patient is completely uptended and you're unable to arouse them that's another indication by the way uh, for an abg when you admit a patient with ab with alter mental status so that's always that's that's a must and the checklist of uh, alter mental status. So the way we treat it, if you give IV normal saline, you're not going to do anything. It's pretty much you're going to be you know, giving her more fluid and you're going to end up killing her from CHF. If you give her a hydrochloric acid, again, that's not going to accomplish anything. Just making the number better, but that's not going to be, uh, that's not going to result in sustained reduction of the, of the bicarbonate level. That's actually what we need to do right now. And the ammonium chloride, you know, that's a dinosaur drug. I've never used it, you know. This is like a hemodialysis is not very effective removing excess bicarbonate. Um, it's very difficult. Once the bicarbonate is there, it's very difficult to remove it if the patient is anuric. If the patient is making urine, the, the, the solution is to give him acetazolamide. Remember, acetazolamide is a uh, carbon anhydrase inhibitor. It works in the proximal tubule and it has many clinical uses in medicine. One of them is the prevention of uh, altitude sickness and also um, a lot of doctors like ophthalmology doctors they use it for glaucoma. Um, we in nephrology we use it for augmented uh, diuresis and we also use it in this setting when the patients require like like we have severe metabolic alkalosis, you want to help them out a little bit, bringing down, dumping a little bit of that bicarbonate in the urine. That's also going to help with diuresis. So this is the correct answer for this patient because you want to get rid of volume and you want to get rid of bicarbonate. So that's, that's the correct answer for this patient. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Let's do the exercise. So, bicarb here is 12 and not 21. Therefore, we're thinking it's a uh, bicarb is 12 and not 21. Therefore, we're thinking it's a uh, metabolic acidosis or a severe osmosis. Mm -hmm. um, and since the pH is low, it's a metabolic acidosis. Correct. Yeah. What is the winter's formula for this person? Uh, 12 is Mm-hmm. And it's 40. And it's 40. What, higher. what do you need to do there? You need to call anesthesia to intubate this patient as soon as possible. <laughs> she already tired her out. Yeah, she's not breathing. She's actually already, she already tired her out. Yeah, sometimes they call me from the ER like, oh, this patient needs dialysis. Like, no, this patient needs, needs to put an event, intubate her. Dialysis is not going to fix any of these things. So the PCO2 is 40. That means that she's already tiring out and she has a concomitant respiratory acidosis okay and then the anion gap is how much 31 right huge right yeah. so what is the expected bicarbonate 
5 mm -hmm. and the measure is 12 so she also has a alkalosis right so this person has a triple acid base disorder and in process you're attending so what is what does he have No, what else is in the garage? They, they love to test on the boards. Yeah, ethylene glycol. So this guy has basically the metabolic, the gap metabolic acidosis from, from the, from the, you know, from the ethylene glycol, the respiratory acidosis from the respiratory failure, and the metabolic alkalosis. Maybe he was vomiting. Who knows? Who knows what's going on? And this is what they found in the urine. You know, the classic envelope type calcium oxalate crystals. Yeah. Yeah, this question for sure you're gonna get it on the boards. Okay. And now the boards, I haven't taken my internal medicine boards. I last took them five years ago, no, six years ago I took them. And I remember they asked questions about triple acid base. One of the questions had triple acid base. So make sure you guys are comfortable with these little exercises so they don't let you, you know. And it's always, they always want a diagnosis. So it's not hard because when you understand they're not just asking you for a number, they're asking you for a clinical scenario that explains everything. And they're not going to give you like, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. No, it's a clear-cut type of presentation. So that's why you guys cannot get it wrong. Okay. So, why don't you do that last one? 56-year-old. year old man with pancreatic cancer admitted for lethargy. Sodium is 140. Mm -hmm. Potassium 3.9. Chloride 112. Bicarb 17. pH 7.45, PCO2 25, PO2 is 70. So bicarb is a little low, pH is normal. Mm -hmm. So pH is a little bit on the high side. A little high. So how would you call that? So with the bicarb, um, bicarb is a little low, it's either metabolic acidosis a respiratory alkalosis. It's a respiratory alkalosis? Right. Okay. So there's a little cheat sheet. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so helpful. Yeah. You know, until you're very fluent and familiar with this, it's so helpful. Yeah. So what about, but you need to do the expected PCO2. Mm. Expected PCO2. Fully expected PCO2. So it's 17. Mm. So the PCO2 is 25, right? So it's like 15 points below normal, right? Mm -hmm. So you expect to see a change of anywhere from 1.5 to 7.5. And you look at the bicarb? Yes. You do, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there is no second acid base. It's okay, right? And you do the anion gap, and there's no gap. What does he have? From what? What happens if you have pancreatic cancer? No. What happens to cancer patients? Very common. Pneumonia. You're talking about like chemo? No. Like a, one of the complications, or like if you can call them perineoplastic complications. They, they're they hypercoagulable, right? So this person has a PE. Oh. Yeah. yeah. That's why. Yeah. PE. Pulmonary embolism. You know, like sometimes I get called and it's like, do a blood gas. <laughs> And it's not, you know, if you don't do a blood gas, you're going to say, hell, oh, he has a little bit of metabolic acidosis. Metabolic acidosis from what? You need to do a blood gas. And then you realize, like, this guy has primary respiratory alkalosis. You need to rule out P now. Huh. So that's the, that's the utility of doing a blood gas. If you don't have an understanding, breathe out the dioxide. he's blowing out his PCO2. He's breathing too fast. Yeah. And that may be the only manifestation of a pulmonary embolism. It's just hyperventilation. Okay. And patients may not even complain of it. They just start being, 
start breathing faster than they're, they're supposed to. So the differential of primary respiratory alkalosis, like I, I think I mentioned it, is either liver disease, um, um, cirrhosis, pregnancy, gram-negative, gram-negative bacteremia, uh, uh, CNS occupying lesions, and pulmonary embolism. That's basically, or any, any type of respiratory process, like if you have pneumonia or, right? yeah. But anyway, that was the last slide. I'll send you guys the, the copies with Ramiro so you can practice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Just make sure you practice. This is a very complex topic in medicine and you always forget it. It takes some practice and some effort from your part like to review it and to do the exercise every time you admit a patient. In medicine, I, I'm telling you, like your job as an intern is to be thorough, is to present the cases in an organized fashion to get a good history. Your attendings are gonna love love you if you if you do this breakdown of the of the acid base. They're gonna love it, and it, it really makes you think as a real internist when you're when you're admitting someone. And you know the nice thing about like I said nephrology is that I I can pretty much explain everything from the numbers numbers perspective before I go and talk to a patient. Sometimes things don't make any sense, but that's more like the exception rather than the rule. And that's why I, lo I love nephrology because a lot of the things make sense. You know, when you when you do this exercise, it makes sense. All right. Thank you. You guys have any questions? Any anything else? Yeah, thank you. Any any? I'll send it to Ramirez so you guys can. Oh, cute family! There's everyone. Oh. <laughs>